welcome back to the Accessible Art History YouTube channel. Today I'm wrapping up the AP Art History images from ancient Egypt. There are a lot of them, so I had to separate it into two videos. You'll find part one linked in the description box below and in the eye in the corner. The remaining images are from the New Kingdom period, which was filled with expansion, change, chaos, and of course, amazing art. So to learn more, keep on watching. The first image of today's video is the Temple of Amun-Re and its hypostyle hall. Located in Karnak, Thebes, now known as Luxor, this temple was the religious center for ancient Egypt. It was dedicated to the worship of Egypt's principal god, Amun-Re. He was the god of the sun and the air, a combination of the god Amun and Ra. The temple was also the site of a worship for Mut, a mother goddess, and Mantu, a god of war. Although temple construction started in the Middle Kingdom period, it didn't reach its biggest expanse until the New Kingdom period. Over time, pharaohs would leave their mark by building different spaces in honor of the gods. The city was believed to be, quote, the most selective places, Ipet Esut, and eventually it became the largest religious complex in the world. It's still among the largest to this day. Two of the most fantastic features of the complex include the Avenue of Ram Sculptures and the world's tallest obelisk that was erected by Hachetza, although the obelisk was eventually taken to Rome by Constantine. Another one of the architectural wonders of the temple complex is its hypostyle hall. In ancient times, builders grappled with how to make tall buildings without having them come crashing down. One of the ancient Egyptian solutions to this was a hypostyle hall. The space with this tiered roof held up by 134 massive columns. These columns were brightly painted and decorated to match the splendor of the surrounding temple complex. With all of these columns, one would think the space would feel dark and dreary. But that's where the tiered roof came in. By making the center of the roof higher, the architects created what we call a clerestory. This was a new technique that allowed light to filter into the space. It was an incredibly popular technique and would be utilized across cultures over the centuries. The sunlight would have illuminated the paintings on the columns, making it a truly spectacular sight. The next image on the required list is the Mortuary Temple of Hatshepsut. Not only is it an iconic work of ancient Egyptian architecture, but it is also the final resting place of one of its most powerful women. Hatshepsut was the fifth pharaoh of the illustrious 18th royal dynasty. She was the daughter, wife, and stepmother to pharaohs. But more importantly, she was the second woman in Egyptian history to take the pharaonic throne in her own right. It is believed that she ruled for about 21 years until her death. During her reign, Egypt established new trade routes, launched massive building projects. However, when her stepson Thutmose III came to power, he tried to erase all traces of her. Hatshepsut Mortuary Temple is built into the hills of Deir el Bahare near the ancient city of Thebes, modern-day Luxor. A large ramp or causeway leads up from the desert to the temple. Fascinatingly, there were two separate purposes for the space, each situated along a different axis. The east-west axis acted as the receiving place for the ship or bark of Amun-Re, the main deity of Egypt. This was quite unusual because it took up the majority of the space in the temple, including where the typical burial chamber and associated rooms would be. But it's likely Hatshepsut was trying to emphasize her position as pharaoh and god's wife of Amun. The north-south axis represented a cycle of rebirth and the life of a pharaoh. This was incredibly important as a testament to the fundamental beliefs in ancient Egyptian society. The entire mortuary temple pointed towards Hatshepsut's personal contribution to Karnak, the eighth pylon. In addition to dedications to Amun-Re, there were also two smaller temples dedicated to Hathor and Anubis. Akhenaten was pharaoh of the 18th dynasty during the New Kingdom period. He was the second son of Amenhotep III and his queen, the great royal wife Ki. Records indicate that Akhenaten ruled alongside his father as co-pharaoh for about eight years. When his father died around 1353 BCE, Akhenaten became the pharaoh in his own right. His queen was the famous Nefertiti, and together they had six daughters, Meritaten, Mekataten, Ankhensenapaten, also known as Anaxunamen, Neferneferaten, Tasheret, Neferneferure, and Setapanre. Akhenaten also had one recorded son, the famous Tutankhamun. For the first five years of his reign, Akhenaten was known as Amenhotep IV, and his policies were fairly consistent with the rulers that came before him. But then something changed. He decided that the majority of Egyptian worship would be directed at a single god, the sun disk, Aten. This is when he changed his name to Akhenaten. This relief carving is a perfect example of Amana period art. This is what we call the period of Akhenaten's rule. It shows the pharaoh, Nefertiti, and three of their daughters, and dates from around 1350 BCE. Given its size and subject, art historians believe that it was used as a personal home altar. It's a tender family scene of worship. Akhenaten carefully cradles one of the girls, bringing her close for a paternal kiss. 
Nefertiti has one of the daughters on her lap while the other plays with her earring. The couple sits on a pair of thrones to remind the viewer that they are the rulers of Egypt. The figures all look quite strange to the modern viewer's eye. They have wide hips, large bellies and lips, and thin limbs. The most interesting detail is their extremely elongated skulls. <laughs> they kind of look like potatoes. It's an interesting depiction that has led some historians to believe that they suffered from a medical condition. Examination of his mummy has not led to a diagnosis, though. Today, most art historians believe that this was a deliberate stylistic choice. More importantly, above the royal family is the sun disk Aten. His rays shine down on him in a gesture of blessing. The ones that touch the figures have small hands holding anks. In ancient Egypt, these were the symbols of life. By including this detail, it showed the Aten as the life giver of the people. Tutankhamun was born around 1342 BCE, the son of Akhenaten, and a woman named, quote, the younger lady, by the archaeologists who discovered her mummy. All three of these people were members of the 18th royal dynasty during the New Kingdom period. Despite advances in scientific technology, Egyptologists still don't have a name for the young lady. Though, through DNA testing, it was determined that she was Akhenaten's full sister, meaning that they were both children of Pharaoh Amenhotep III and Queen T. Incest was quite common in ancient Egypt because... Incest was quite common in the ancient Egyptian royal family because it mimicked the sacred union of Osiris and Isis. Due to this, Tutankhamun had a number of congenital issues, including a clubbed foot, cleft palate, and scoliosis. Like his parents before him, Tutankhamun married his half-sister, Anaksunamun. They shared the same father, but Nefertiti was not the mother. They shared the same father, but not the same mother. In his tomb, there are many images of the couple of co-rulers, indicating that he made his sister the great royal wife. Sadly, Tutankhamun would only reign for about 10 years. He died around 1325 BCE at the age of 19. His reign was not remarkable, though that wasn't his fault. It was just too short for him to be an effective ruler. He's buried hastily, and that's why we were able to find his tomb. He was the last of his line, and it wasn't long before the 19th dynasty took over the of Egypt. The discovery of King Tut's tomb just had his 100th anniversary on November 4th. On that day in 1922, Howard Carter uncovered one of the greatest finds in history. According to his notes, Carter said this about the discovery, and this was written down in The Treasures of Tutankhamun, published by the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Quote, At first, I could see nothing. The hot air escaping from the chamber caused the candle flame to flicker, but presently, as my eyes grew accustomed to the light, details of the room within emerged slowly from the mist. Strange animals, statues, and gold. Everywhere, the glint of gold. After a pause, Carnarvon asked, Can you see anything? And I replied, Yes, wonderful things. The innermost coffin was made of this gold. Besides it being incredibly luxurious and fit for a king, it had a symbolic reason. Ancient Egyptians believed that their gods had golden skin, silver bones, and blue hair. So this coffin used those materials, and lapis lazuli for the blue, to show Tut in his defined form. Pharaohs were often thought to be gods of the, or the physical manifestation of gods on earth, so this was quite appropriate. The symbols of kingship, the crook and flail, and the goddesses Nekbet, the vulture, and Wajet, the cobra, also show us that Tut was the pharaoh when he died. In addition, Isis and Nephthys, two important goddesses, are etched into the gold lid, showing that Tutankhamun had returned Egypt to its rightful religion after his father's heresy. The Book of the Dead, although ominous sounding, was actually known as the Book of Coming Forth by Day or Book of Emerging Forth into the Light during the ancient Egyptian period was a funeral text that consisted of magic spells and instructions on how to make it through the duat, or underworld, and into the afterlife. The book is a rather generous term, as it was more of a collection of texts written over a period of about a thousand years by priests. This page is from an excellent surviving example of a page from the Book of the Dead. It was made for a man named Hunifer, who lived around 1310 BCE. He held many esteemed positions, including royal scribe, scribe of divine offerings, overseer of royal cattle, and steward to Pharaoh Seti. These positions have would have made him, which is indicated by the fine craftsmanship of this papyrus. The main scene of this page is the opening of the mouth ceremony. Hunifer's mummy is shown supported by the god Anubis. His wife and children mourn his death, and the priests prepare to open the mummy's mouth so that he could breathe and speak in the afterlife. This was an incredibly important moment in funerary rituals of ancient Egypt. The priests and Anubis are shown as the largest figures in the scene. This is a technique called hierarchy of scale. Essentially, they are the most important figures because they are the biggest. The colors of this work are still vibrant after 3,000 years, and we can still read the magical spells on the page. That wraps up, mummy pun intended, the ancient Egypt unit of the APR History of Required Images. 
These pieces showcase the whole of Egyptian history and its brilliant, vibrant artistic culture. We still have a lot of Unit 2 to discuss, so keep an eye out for the next video on the series on Ancient Greece.